No one will hear your cry in space, or something like that. We've all heard this famous chilling phrase, and it's actually true. Space, for the most part, consists of a giant nothingness. There's a lot of, you know, space in space. But this doesn't mean there are no sounds in space. In fact, there are plenty of them. And some of them can even make you shiver. Let's take a look at the scariest space sounds. First of all, how are cosmic sounds even recorded? Sound is just the vibration of molecules. When you scream, you make the molecules push each other furiously until they reach the ear of the person you're yelling at. Then these vibrations get transmitted to the brain, and we recognize them as something that you might need to apologize for. In other words, to hear something, we need molecules. And that's where things get complicated. There aren't any of them in space. The entire universe almost completely consists of a vacuum. No, not a hoover absolute nothingness. However, the wizards from NASA still record space sound somehow. So how do they do it? The thing is, there are some types of waves that don't care about molecules. We regular folk can't perceive them without some special devices. These waves include, for example, radio waves. We'll need a radio or something like that to recognize them. And that's exactly what NASA's satellites do. They catch random radio waves. Thanks to their heroism, we can find out how different cosmic bodies sound. These satellites record a variety of waves, fluctuations of plasmas, magnetic fields, and other, you know, stuff. And then scientists from NASA transform all this into normal soundtracks. And some of them sound quite frightening, to put it mildly. Let's take our magnetic field, for example. It surrounds our planet like an invisible shield, protecting us from all sorts of nasties, like radiation and solar winds. At the same time, we can neither see it, feel it, nor hear. Oops. Well, the last one is outdated. Scientists from the Technical University of Denmark took magnetic waves recorded by the ESA swarm satellite. They converted them into an audio track and got a pretty creepy result. Now, to be honest, it sounds more like an eerie entity stalking you in the middle of the night. And if you remember the maps of Earth's magnetic field, it starts to feel like a spider crawling nearby. Ew. And this isn't the first strange sound that we caught on Earth. Recently, we caught another weird radio emission from space. Scientists found out that the repeating signal came from somewhere very far away, like billions of light years away from us. Such fast radio bursts usually lasted no longer than a few milliseconds, but this one was unique. It lasted about three seconds, basically thousands of times longer than usual. And at the same time, the signal was very precise, so much so that scientists even compared it to a heartbeat. Scientists believe that this signal is caused by pulsars, or neutron stars. One time, Nikola Tesla caught something similar. But unfortunately, at that time, we didn't know about such things as pulsars. So Tesla was sure that he had caught a message from some extraterrestrial life. It's a pity that the truth turned out to be much more boring. But let's move on from the Earth to the Moon. In 1969, the astronauts of the Apollo 10 mission, the spacecraft that made the final test flight to the Moon, flew past its surface. And then they caught some strange signals coming from the dark side of the Moon, the side that we never see because the Moon is tidally locked to us. The sound was so weird that the astronauts weren't even sure whether to report it to NASA. They were afraid they wouldn't be taken seriously and maybe even not allowed to participate in the next space missions. Here's what it sounded like. But according to NASA, it's not some creepy extraterrestrial music at all. These may just be some radio waves that affected each other because of their proximity. Although the astronauts who heard it for the first time probably felt a little creeped out. Let's move to the other planets. Now, 40 years ago, scientists actively explored the surface of Venus. They sent as many as 10 probes there, which were supposed to capture audio and video shooting from the surface. Now we know what Venus, which could easily destroy us at any attempt to even get close to it, sounds like. Horrifying. And you wouldn't expect anything else from the most dangerous planet in the solar system. Unfortunately, Venus is even more toxic than the average Twitter user. <laughs> so these probes didn't last too long. They heroically arrived on a planet and soon broke down. Next one is Jupiter. 
this space giant, which is 11 times larger than the Earth, never fails to scare us. One of NASA's probes, Juno, flies around Jupiter every few weeks. The probe is moving at a tremendous speed, 130,000 miles per hour. One day, Juno caught one of the strongest invisible signals it had ever encountered. This was the point at which the mad solar wind came into conflict with the magnetic field of Jupiter. It kind of sounded like a cosmic boom. The original sound lasted two hours, but it was compressed to a few seconds. It actually sounds more like a collision of a sea wave and a rock. But here, in terms of horror, Jupiter surprisingly loses to one of its small moons, Ganymede. In 2021, the Galileo space probe flew past Ganymede, and during its flight, it received a rather strange recording. These sounds are satellite radiation, and it's unclear whether it sounds like a cozy sunny day in the jungle or like thousands of bats waiting for you in the night. Next one is Saturn. This signal was caught by the Cassini-Huygens Automatic Interplanetary Station, which was launched into space in 1997. When flying past Saturn, Cassini recorded a pretty scary sound. This terrifying cry of thousands of souls is actually just some radio waves. They aren't too different from what the auroras emit on Earth. A little later, Cassini received another recording. The sounds made by lightning and thunderstorms on Saturn. They sound pretty interesting, too. More like popping corn or a Geiger counter, right? But that's just because these lightning strikes have a crazy frequency. Moving on from the solar system to outer space. The famous Voyager 1 was launched back in 1977 and continues to send us data even 40 years after its launch. In 2012, it left the solar system and entered interstellar space. And then, while abandoning its home, Voyager 1 detected the sound of plasma waves. The original recording lasted seven months. But fortunately, scientists felt sorry for us and reduced it to 12 seconds. It isn't really eerie, but is still kind of unsettling. And although it feels like nothing can beat Saturn's horrors, let's end this tournament with one of the scariest objects in the universe, a black hole. This sound was recorded by the Chandra Space Telescope. While studying a cluster of galaxies in the constellation Perseus, they discovered something strange. Some undulating movements appear from the center of the cluster. They spread out in all directions, like circles on the water. Scientists have suggested that this was caused by a supermassive black hole. The thing is, black holes don't always devour space objects entirely. Sometimes they kind of spit them out. This causes vibrations of gases, which we can convert into sound tracks. What's interesting is that the oscillation of each such wave actually lasts about 10 million years. You're just listening to a very accelerated recording. Scientists have reduced the delay between oscillations by about 144 quadrillion times. So let's check it out. This is probably the eeriest sound from the whole list. Nothing too loud or wild, but there's something dark and disturbing about it. Now, those were the scariest space sounds captured by NASA. To be fair, most of them sounded creepy simply because they're radio waves. But it's still fun to get spooked sometimes. The ground shakes and you hear a loud cracking sound. Oh no, the dome is failing. Everyone runs to their escape pods to evacuate. People are pushing and shoving. The Earth-like atmosphere in the dome is going to be compromised, and you'll be exposed to the thin elements on the surface of Mars. Everyone rushes to put their helmets on. The crack is getting bigger by the second, and people are panicking, trying to get on the escape shuttles as quickly as possible. In the chaos, they all jam into the wrong ships, and there isn't any room for you. Red warning lights begin to flash in the dome, and a voice rings out, telling everyone to put their helmets on. The Martian atmosphere is only minutes away from rushing in, and humans won't be able to breathe otherwise. This is just your luck. You only just arrived on Mars. As the ships zoom off into the distance, you wonder what you should do. You call out for help, but no one answers. Suddenly, a robot guide rolls up behind you, and you hear a faint noise coming from its speakers. It says, no one can hear you because the atmosphere on Mars is so much less dense than on Earth. 
It also has a lot of carbon dioxide, which absorbs sound waves. Even if a loud concert was happening just 30 feet away, it would sound like it was miles away. Would you like me to assist you with anything? You ask it for help, and it shows you a 3D layout of the entire dome. You can see a few other shuttle stations, so you decide to aim for them. Unfortunately, you're going to need to get to the opposite side of the dome to reach another shuttle station. Just as you begin to panic and wonder how you could get there, the robot transforms into a bike and tells you to hop on. You get in and cruise through the city, looking at all the empty buildings and streets. The crack is getting even bigger, and tiny pieces of the dome begin to fall from above, like snow. When you arrive at the other station, the last few people are boarding the only shuttle. You chase after them, desperately trying to get their attention. As you ding the bell on your bike, though, it barely makes any noise at all. Their ship pulls away before they can notice you. You ask why sounds aren't working, and the robot explains that you can barely hear high-pitched noises on Mars. The carbon dioxide makes high-pitched noises, like bells and chirping birds, almost impossible to hear. If only you were still on Earth, they might have noticed you. The robot tells you that there's one last chance to escape. He transforms into a tiny spaceship. You get in, and he flies through the crack in the dome out into space. It's going so fast that you should be back on Earth before long. Just as you're starting to relax and enjoy the sights of space, you see a red light flashing on the robot. You ask it what's wrong, but you get no response. Suddenly, you realize that you can't hear anything in space. Sound travels in waves, and it needs something to move through, like air or water. Space is a vacuum with no air, so you can't hear any sounds at all. The spaceship suddenly changes direction and blasts off away from Earth. You try to steer the robot in the right direction, but you can't figure out how to get its attention. The ship charts a flight all the way to Venus. As you get closer, the turbulence kicks in. Venus has winds faster than any tornado on Earth. You keep getting swept away, trying to find a safe space to land in. The robot manages to keep a steady course, despite the wind throwing it all over the place. You can already feel the heat through all the layers. Finally, the robot spots a small cave in the distance and attempts to land there. As soon as the robot touches ground, it morphs into a spacesuit you can wear, so you're safe in the extreme environment. Today's forecast in Venus? Heat. Extremely boiling temperatures all day and night. Expect clouds of sulfuric acid and gale force winds. The atmosphere is mainly made up of carbon dioxide, so you can expect your voice to drop deeper too because of the planet's dense atmosphere. It's only the second planet closest to the sun, but it's actually the hottest. Its atmosphere traps the heat from the sun and keeps it around the planet. It's actually so hot on Venus that it could melt lead. If you were cruising by with the spaceship, the whole thing would melt in a matter of minutes. Luckily, you have this indestructible robot armor. You try to ask the robot how to get back, and your voice sounds crazy. Your vocal cords vibrate slower here than on Earth, which makes the pitch lower. But at the same time, the speed of sound on Venus is a lot faster, making it more squeaky. Then, the high carbon dioxide content in the air creates a weird effect that tricks your brain into thinking that the sound source is small. Overall, you sound something like a cartoon duck. You look out across the horizon and see many hills and mountains scattered across the plain. But the robot tells you that many of these are volcanoes. Venus actually has more volcanoes than any other planet in the solar system. Scientists discover more than 1,600 only on the surface, which could mean there are even more than that still undiscovered. Yeah, maybe being here all day isn't such a good idea. And not just because of the heat. A single day on Venus lasts 243 Earth days. In fact, a day on Venus is longer than a year, because it only takes 225 days for it to complete a rotation around the Sun. It's hard to understand each other, but you eventually manage. The robot tells you that it just got lost, and that you'll be back on Earth in no time. While walking around the cave, you realize that you're actually inside a volcano. You tell the robot to hurry up and get you back home before it erupts. It's clearly not very good at navigating space, though, because it's not long before you end up somewhere else. You're now on Titan, Saturn's largest moon. The moon is so large that it's even bigger than Mercury, the planet closest to the Sun. The spaceship arrives in the atmosphere, which feels and behaves similar to Earth's. 
The only noticeable difference is the orangey haze hanging in the air, which makes it a lot more difficult to see. As you descend towards the moon, the robot detects signs of cyanide gas all over the surface and fluffy clouds made out of iced methane. You land on a soft spot and set about trying to get the robot to take you back to the right place. At least this time, you're not sweating. The robot transforms again and begins to scan the surroundings. The atmosphere is around 60% thicker than on Earth. Walking around feels like you're wading through maple syrup. There is a really high nitrogen content in the air, so things sound surprisingly similar to how they do on Earth. You tell the robot you really want to get home now but it comes out as a loud, raspy shout. This is because Titan has more nitrogen than Earth, and because sound travels a bit slower. Luckily, you can still understand each other here. The robot tells you that it needs to absorb a bit more energy from its solar panels before taking off, so you have a look around. This moon is one of the only things in the solar system that has fixed bodies of liquid like rivers, lakes, and seas on its surface. You can understand why the robot got lost now, given how similar Titan is to Earth. Titan even has liquid cycles, with rain, evaporation, and condensation. This isn't water, like back on Earth, though. The main liquid here is methane. Scientists think that there may be volcanic activity, but instead of molten hot lava spewing out, it's water. Other planets, like Mars, have ice on the peaks of their mountains and evidence of water beneath the surface. But nothing is as close to Earth as Titan. Some scientists believe that this moon could be our next home billions of years from now. The Sun's temperature will increase by then, making the Earth's atmosphere uninhabitable. By then, Titan's cool temperatures will be good enough to create stable oceans and sustain life. The robot finally gathers enough electricity to fly away, so you can head home. It'll be nice to have a normal conversation where your voice doesn't sound like an exaggerated cartoon. Whew. Now, space missions used to be this big deal, but now they're starting to feel like a walk in the park. But there's a catch. Our bodies aren't exactly built for surviving on other planets. Now, I know what you're thinking. Our bodies will eventually adapt and evolve, right? Well, yeah, evolution is always on the clock. But let's be real here, it's not going to happen overnight. We're not talking about a cool million years for some changes to kick in. And honestly, who's got the time for that? So, how about tweaking our genes just a little bit to make living on other planets easier? Genetic modifications are all about changing an organism's genetic material, like its DNA, to give it some cool new traits or characteristics. Now, picture this. Scientists could totally mess around with our genes to make us more resistant to crazy temperatures. You know, like the temperature fluctuations of the moon, minus 298 degrees Fahrenheit at night to 224 degrees Fahrenheit daytime. Wow. They might even figure out a way to make us super tough against radiation, which is a huge deal in space or on planets with weak atmospheres. We definitely don't want to get fried out there. Oh, and here's another thing they could do tackle the effects of low gravity. Spending too much time in low gravity can really mess up our muscles, bones, and even our heart. But if they tweak those genes related to muscle and bone growth, we could become super strong and resistant to all those nasty effects. However, it's not as simple as it might seem. The technology for safe and precise genetic modifications is still in its early stages, so it might even take as much time as it would for our bodies to naturally evolve and adapt to other planets. There are a couple of nice exoplanets where humanity might potentially live. I'm talking about Gliese 667cc, Kepler 442b, Kepler 62e, Kepler 452b, Gliese 837, you name it. In fact, I'm sure you can do a better job of naming than these. Now, consider Gleesey 667cc. Um, in fact, let's nickname this one Gary for short. Turns out that Gary gets about 90% of the light that Earth does. But instead of regular visible light, this planet mostly gets infrared light. To put it simpler, Gary is rocking only 20% of the visible light that Earth gets. Yep, it's a bit darker over there. So, do we need really warm clothes and night vision goggles to thrive on this planet? Nah, not really. In addition to darkness, Gary is estimated to have a higher mass than Earth, meaning it likely has a stronger gravitational pull. 
To adapt, humans would need to hit the gym at least twice a day. Translation? Humans would need to develop stronger muscles and bones to withstand the increased gravity. Over generations, natural selection might favor individuals with these adaptations. We still know too little about these exoplanets to move there anytime soon. Hey, how about some planets in our solar system? Let's discover our top picks. This way, we can easily figure out what changes we need to make. So, first things first, let's eliminate the two ice giants in our solar system and their friends. Yep, Neptune, Uranus, and the two gas giants Saturn and Jupiter. Sorry guys, but terraforming you is just not gonna happen. Even so, we still have four super cool candidates right here in our solar system. You all know them well. Venus and Mars, the popular kids on the block. And then we have Jupiter's moon, Callisto, and Saturn's moon, Titan. They might not be as famous, but they've got some serious potential to become Earth 2.0. So, it turns out some of Jupiter's moons are super cool for terraforming. They're packed with water, which is a big plus. But here's the catch. Only Callisto is far enough from Jupiter's radiation belt. You see, on Earth, we get hit with about 0.24 rems of radiation per year. But, for instance, Ganymede, another of Jupiter's moons, gives away a whopping 8 rems per day. Just to make it clear, professional workers here on Earth can have more than 5 rem per year. Callisto is different, though. We don't need to tweak our genes, as it only gets about 0.01 rems per day, which we humans can totally handle. Now, let's not get too carried away with the idea that life on Callisto is all sunshine and beaches, like in California. Nope, it's more like an icy wonderland out there. So if you ever find yourself on Callisto, make sure to pack your snazziest protective clothing and some high-tech heating systems. Honestly, at this point, we might as well wish for evolution to take us back to our furry animal days. I mean, think about it. Our ancestors were rocking some serious fur game, just like those cool chimps and gorillas. But as time went on and we got all fancy with our evolution, we decided to ditch the fur coat and go for a more minimalist look. Now, why did we lose our fur? That's a question that has puzzled scientists for ages. Darwin thought it was about finding less hairy mates, while others believed it was to keep those pesky lice away. But these days, most researchers think it all comes down to staying cool. Picture this. Our ancestors were strutting their stuff on open, dry lands after they learned to walk on two legs. Think of a patchy forest or a sunny savanna instead of a lush rainforest. In that kind of environment, overheating was a real threat. So we evolved to have less body hair and more sweat glands to help us cool down by sweating like crazy. Now Titan, the moon of Saturn, is like a treasure chest of resources just waiting to be cracked open. We're talking hydrocarbon reserves that make Earths look like a kid's play, with petroleum for days. Plus, it's got all sorts of organic compounds like methane, ammonia, and water. And don't forget its atmosphere is a nitrogen party, just like early Earths. Here's where it gets really interesting. If Titan's atmosphere is similar to what Earth used to be, we could totally transform it into a modern Earth-like atmosphere. Picture this, giant mirrors in space beaming sunlight onto Titan's surface, heating things up and releasing water vapor. Oxygenated atmosphere coming right up. And to top it off, Titan hangs out within Saturn's magnetosphere, so it's shielded from those pesky solar winds. Now Titan's gravity is about one-seventh that of Earth, which could lead to muscle and bone deterioration over time. To counteract that, our bodies would need to develop stronger muscles and denser bones to withstand the lower gravity. Seems like Earth is the only place where we can't skip gym without gravitational consequences. Now, when it comes to being the hottest planet, Mercury may be the Sun's next-door neighbor, but Venus takes the crown. The temperature there is a scorching 870 degrees Fahrenheit on average. It's like trying to survive in a pot of boiling water or in the fiery depths of Venus itself. I guess the richest people out there would be those selling sunscreens and ice cream! <laughs> Sorry folks, no amount of evolution can turn us into superhumans who can handle Venus's extreme conditions. The only beings that theoretically could possibly thrive there are tardigrades. These tiny cute little critters that look like caterpillars and have some seriously impressive toughness. 
They can survive boiling water, the darkest depths of the ocean, and even the freezing airless emptiness of space. In fact, they were part of a scientific study on a spacecraft that unfortunately crashed on the moon. Still, recent research proves that even these guys won't survive on Venus. Now, look at this guy. He's been kicking it on Mars for ages, which explains why he's rocking the wrong shade of self-tan. Turns out, all those carrot-loving carotenoids in his diet, like sweet potatoes, bell peppers, tomatoes, and pumpkins, are the aces up his sleeve protecting him against UV rays. The more he munches on those, the more he turns into a walking orange. And let me tell you, his strength? It's all about that Martian gravity, my friend. The gravity there messes with our perception of weight. So if you want to be a boss on Mars, you gotta chow down big time. Like, if you weigh 150 pounds on Earth, it feels like you're carrying no more than 55 pounds on Mars. So overindulging in food can totally help bridge that gap between gravity and weight. Ooh, time to feast like a Martian! The infinite vasts of the universe hold endless possibilities and secrets. And here's one of the intriguing questions. How life and we as humans would look like on other planets. Imagine a world where the laws of physics, the environment, and the conditions are vastly different from what we're used to. How would we adapt and evolve to survive in these strange new lands? Let's see. Mercury is the closest planet to the Sun and has a thin atmosphere. The temperatures there are extreme, with the day side reaching over 800 degrees Fahrenheit and the night side dropping to negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit. So, what can we do to survive these crazy temperatures and constant solar radiation? Maybe we can magically turn into metal. For example, titanium and platinum can perfectly tolerate high temperatures. But seriously though, there is an option. We could settle underground, where the temperatures aren't so frenzied. If we lived underground, we might evolve with large eyes to better capture light. We might also evolve thicker skin to protect ourselves from the intense radiation. Basically, we have two options – become metal or become moles. Let's move on to Venus. This planet is extremely hostile. First of all, Venus is known for its thick, more toxic than your ex type of atmosphere. The whole planet is covered with carbon dioxide and its surface is absolutely dry, making it incredibly hot. The average temperature is around 847 degrees Fahrenheit, making it one of the hottest planets in our solar system. Also, don't forget about the crazy pressure. Standing on Venus would be like standing 3,000 feet underwater. Only particular hardy microbes from Earth could survive in such conditions. So, if you want to live on Venus, you might have to become a microbe. But unfortunately, since we're not microbes, we have to wear special gear and equipment to survive there. Maybe we'd have to develop a heat-resistant exoskeleton to protect ourselves, as well as get some new lungs that can filter out the toxic elements in the atmosphere. Let's talk about our favorite red sibling, Mars. The first noticeable change after a few hundred years would be your new skeleton. The gravity on Mars is much weaker than on Earth, so your muscles and bones would shrink. To make up for this difference, you'd have to eat more and probably start going to the gym. Also, you'd have to adapt to the low atmospheric pressure and colder temperatures. You need to retain heat, right? That means you'd need a thicker layer of body fat. Sorry folks, but on Mars, we might become fatter. Another reason to start working out. Another big change would occur in your skin. Your skin is like a big barrier that protects you from harmful things such as bacteria, UV light, looking totally creepy, and so on. So what would happen to it? Most likely, you would turn orange, due to the carotenoids. Carotenoids are a type of nutrient that you get from foods such as carrots, potatoes, tomatoes, and so on. They protect very well against ultraviolet radiation on Mars. They only have one downside. By eating a lot of pumpkins from the Martian farmer's market, you'll gradually start to turn orange. But maybe it's not so bad. Maybe life on Jupiter would be easier. Yeah, no, it has no solid land. This planet is made up of hydrogen and helium and is referred to as a gas giant. You would simply float there, like in a huge cloud. And even if you managed to land and tried to walk, it would be like moving through a super thick fog. So how would we evolve there? 
Firstly, we might become much larger in size to withstand the immense pressures. Secondly, the temperature fluctuations on Jupiter are enormous. The surface is terrifyingly cold and the temperature rises significantly under the outer layers of the atmosphere. Thirdly, if you lived on Jupiter, there would be no verbal language. This gas giant absorbs radio waves, so even if you were speaking, no one would hear you. There would be no music either, so no parties. And what's the point then? Hey, maybe we could communicate with sign language, but that's not so simple either. Jupiter is full of wild winds and storm clouds, so it's unlikely you would be able to see anything. So even if we evolved there in some way, our lives would still not be easy. Before landing on Saturn, you would probably want to check out its iconic rings, but you wouldn't be able to do that because Saturn's rings consist of a bunch of ice particles flying in space, so it would be extremely hard to land. So let's go straight to Saturn itself. At first, it may seem that Saturn is not bad for us. Some layers of this gas giant have quite pleasant temperatures. If we dive deeper into Saturn, it gets surprisingly warm, up to 26 degrees Fahrenheit in its second layer. This is an average temperature in countries like Sweden and Canada. But unfortunately, this is only one such layer. The rest of the planet is incredibly cold, so in order to survive on Saturn, we'd have to do a lot of work. In addition to the cold, we'd have to deal with the planet's harsh environment, including its intense storms, strong winds, and radiation. To protect ourselves from these conditions, we'd need to evolve tough skin again, find some insulation, and so on. Next planet is Uranus. Uranus has a very different environment from Earth, with much colder temperatures, a lack of a solid surface, and a much different atmosphere. It's like another Jupiter, but with blue vibes. It's not that bad, though. There's even water on Uranus. The only problem is, the planet is full of ammonia, that nasty stuff we use for cleaning. So don't be surprised if you feel the gross smell. Also, it's incredibly cold out there, almost like a never-ending winter. So what would it be like to survive in such a dark and harsh environment? We'd need thicker skin again to cope with extreme temperatures. And again, we'd need larger eyes to see better in all this darkness. We might even have to develop a new hearing system like that of dolphins. Wouldn't that be fun? Let's move on to Neptune. If human beings were to evolve on Neptune, they would need to adapt to its harsh conditions. Neptune, the eighth and farthest planet from our sun, is another gas giant. The only difference is this planet may have a solid core. If we were to live on Neptune, we'd need to float or swim in its methane-rich atmosphere. We'd also need to develop gills or something like that in order to breathe. Basically, we turn into space reptiles or cosmic fishes. The gravity on Neptune is slightly stronger than Earth's, but strong winds make it difficult to stand in one place. To withstand the wind, we need to be much heavier. Once again, you need to eat a lot and pump up some muscles. Yeah, yeah, technically it's not a planet, but we still love it and can't forget it. A small, distant, and incredibly cold world. Pluto's even smaller than our moon, and because of that, there's almost no gravity there. It will be extremely difficult to stand on it. To avoid accidentally flying into outer space while playing football, we need to create a fake gravity machine. And if we don't want to feel dizzy, we need to evolve a brand new nervous system. But Pluto isn't all that bad. For example, there's liquid water under the surface and even some icy mountains. Maybe it would be possible to survive there if we had some serious equipment, clothes, supplies, and nah, too much hassle. Anyway, from the scorching heat of Mercury to the freezing temperatures of Neptune, each planet has a unique set of environmental challenges and opportunities for evolution. While we may never truly know what humans would look like on these other worlds, it's exciting to consider the endless possibilities. Never stop looking at the stars and asking these questions. Picture this. You've won a membership to a space gym. You get to travel around the solar system and work out. But gravity changes on different space bodies. So let's find out if you can get stronger elsewhere or if you should keep practicing on Earth. Your spaceship is approaching dwarf planet Pluto. It's getting chillier by the second. No wonder! The sun is over 3.7 billion miles away. You must be glad you brought your thermal spacesuit along, right? 
To leave the spacecraft, Earthlings would need the help of a gravity machine, since gravity on Pluto is a mere one-fifteenth of that on Earth. Gravity is the force that pulls you toward the ground. The smaller the mass of a space body is, the weaker its gravity. So, on Pluto, you can't do any sports that involve running. If you did, you'd most likely fly away. You can try out elephant lifting, though. After all, you can't do it back on Earth. On Pluto, picking up an elephant weighing 2,000 pounds feels like lifting 120 pounds. The next stop is Neptune. It's over 30 times farther away from the Sun than Earth. The atmosphere there is dark and cold. You might get overwhelmed by the planet's gigantic size. It's called an ice giant for a reason. Maybe today you'll feel like doing some winter sports? To say Neptune exists in perpetual winter is an understatement. The average temperature on this planet is around minus 373 degrees Fahrenheit. But gravity here is only 10% stronger than that on Earth, so you don't feel much difference. This world doesn't have a solid surface, so you won't be able to leave the spacecraft. Is that an ice hockey rink I see? Grab your ice skates and your stick and get ready to outplay your fellow passengers. How about a quick pit stop on Uranus? This is another ice giant, and gravity here is 90% of that on Earth. You can do a few push-ups inside the spacecraft, as you won't be stepping outside. The slushy surface of the planet is made up of water, methane, and ammonia in its liquid form. There's no solid ground to walk on. But if you somehow found a way to go outside, you'd feel lighter than on Earth. If you weighed 100 pounds back home, it would be 90 pounds here. Can we call this a Uranian diet? When approaching Saturn, please mind its rings, which aren't actually rings. They consist of pieces of asteroids and meteors flying around the planet. Saturn's mass is so big that it attracts many other space bodies to its orbit. And right now, you're one of them! Time to get creative with your workout. You've scheduled a skydiving experience here. If you freefall in Saturn's atmosphere, you'll reach the speed of 30 miles per second. Don't forget to open your parachute. Eh, on second thought, though, you won't be able to touch the ground anyway. Saturn's surface is pure gas. Quick fun fact, once Saturn got in the way of the 10th planet forming in the solar system, the planet's debris, which partially makes up Saturn's rings now, could have blended into a planet. But it was pulled into Saturn's orbit instead. You're nearing Europa, one of Jupiter's moons. Gravity here is so weak, you feel weightless. Let's say there's a rock climbing wall there. How about you give it a try? Usually, this sport requires a lot of physical strength. But here, you'll only have to carry 13% of your weight. Your climb to the top will be easy peasy in these conditions. Entering Jupiter's atmosphere will feel like being inside a cloud. See that red spot in the bottom left corner? That's a storm twice the size of Earth that's been raging for hundreds of years. To have some fun here, why don't you do some jumping jacks? I'll count to 100. Ready, set, go! Gravity here is super strong. It's two and a half times as powerful as gravity on Earth. So you'll probably get exhausted at the count of 30. <laughs> Too bad. Uh-oh! Passengers aboard the spacecraft, fasten your seatbelts. You might experience some heavy turbulence. To travel from Jupiter to Mars, you'll have to move through an asteroid belt. Just in case you're worried your ship will bump into something, relax, there's a distance of 300,000 miles between asteroids. Let's stop at Ceres, the only dwarf planet in the asteroid belt. Gravity here will make you feel pretty strong. How about practicing some caber tossing? Cabers are heavy logs that can measure up to 20 feet long. The goal is to throw them as far as possible. Here, a 180-pound pole feels as if it weighs 5 pounds, which is, basically, the weight of a melon. Ready for the series caper competition? Woohoo! Finally, Mars. Remember all those handstands you've always wanted to try? Well, here's the place to do them. Mars's gravity is about 2.5 times weaker than that on Earth, which means you'll probably be able to lift your own body weight without any difficulty. Since people keep trying to terraform Mars, opening a gym here doesn't sound like a bad idea, does it? Passengers and crew members, we're now beginning our descent to Phobos. It's one of Mars's moons. Gravity here is incredibly weak. 
If you've always dreamed of having superhuman strength, this is the place for you. You can work out here by, say, doing some artistic gymnastics. Start off with a cartwheel, then move on to tricks performed in the air. On Phobos, you can start doing triple back handsprings in no time. Ah, look! Earth is about to appear on the horizon. It sure looks majestic from here. But we won't stop there now. Instead, let's visit Earth's sister, Venus. It has almost the same mass as Earth, which means these planets have similar gravities. Now, Earthlings can't survive on Venus's surface because of the large amount of ammonia in its atmosphere. But let's imagine you could practice some outdoor sports there. Do you feel like trying bumper bubble soccer? That's when you dress yourself in a giant bubble ball vest and keep bumping into other players. People play this game on Earth. On Venus, with its slightly weaker gravity, it might be a little bit easier. But still, you have to consider you'll be wearing a 25-pound ball as a vest. Kind of like a hamster back on Earth. Not to mention your outfit will restrict your arms and legs. It's a challenge, but it sounds fun to me. Moving on, if you land on the sunny side of Mercury, you'll experience scalding hot temperatures of 800 degrees Fahrenheit. If you're feeling tired after your space workout, a relaxing, steamy sauna will be just the thing. You'll feel like a brand new person by the time you arrive on the next planet. We'll fly as close to the sun as we can so that you can have a taste of its gravity. The sun's mass is huge. It's over 333,000 times the mass of Earth. And gravity here is extremely powerful. You'd have trouble lifting something as light as a bottle of water if you managed to step on the surface of the sun. Too hot, you say? Well, I imagine it's a whole lot cooler if you come back at night. <laughs> Just kidding! On our way back home, we'll stop by the moon. I mean, our Earth's natural satellite. Walking on the surface of the moon will feel like jumping. You'll be able to jump as far as 33 feet, so why not try some parkour? If you play basketball, scoring a point will be very difficult. But then you can jump higher than the hoop and do an epic slam dunk. And how about baseball? If you throw the ball upward, you'll probably never see it again. Finally, we land on Earth. Sorry to disappoint you, but you're not coming back with any superhuman strength. Even when you were lifting an elephant, gravity was helping you out a lot. It was a good trip, though. Don't you think so? I hope you feel well rested, because I've got a tough task for you. Don't worry, it's fun. You're going to visit different planets of our solar system and try to run on each of them. Let's figure out where you can run the fastest and where you can barely walk. The fastest man on Earth, Usain Bolt, can run with an average speed of about 23 miles per hour. But his top speed is higher, up to 27 miles per hour. Sadly, we can't all be Usain Bolts. The average person runs at a speed of 6 to 8 miles per hour. But maybe there's a planet out there where you can beat the famous Jamaican sprinters' records. But first things first, what will affect your speed when you run on other planets? For one thing, gravity. Depending on how strong it is on the planet you visit, it'll influence your weight. And in most cases, the heavier you are, the more slowly you run. Plus, on all other planets in our solar system except Earth, you'll have to wear a bulky spacesuit. Without it, your chances of survival there are non-existent. And don't forget about extreme weather conditions on most planets. It's either freezing cold or boiling hot, or very, and I mean it, windy. Anyway, your amazing journey is about to begin. Buckle your seatbelt. The first planet on your itinerary is Mercury. As you sneak a peek at this world through the window of your spaceship, you notice that the planet looks eerily similar to the good old moon. But just a few moments later, you realize it's just an illusion. All over the surface of Mercury, you see craters left by space rocks. Hmm, this may make your task of running on this planet way harder. This and your bulky spacesuit. Duh. But you wouldn't survive on Mercury without this protection. The temperatures on the planet are extreme. 800 degrees Fahrenheit during the day and negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit at night. Hey. But there's one thing that can work in your favor on this unfriendly planet. Let's say you weigh 155 pounds on Earth. Then on Mercury, you'd weigh around 58 pounds. Which means that despite your bulky spacesuit, you can move way faster than you do on Earth. 
and maybe your speed will even reach 13 miles per hour if you try really hard. The next planet on your itinerary is Venus, also called the Morning Star. While coming closer, you see a world very different from the bluish planet you might have seen in books. Before landing, you have to get through a super dense atmosphere made up of carbon dioxide. And while your spacecraft is descending, you're watching thick clouds of sulfuric acid pass by. Venus is often called Earth's twin because these two planets are of similar size and density. No wonder that on Venus, you weigh almost as much as you do on Earth, 140 pounds. So your weight is a bit smaller here, but don't forget about your spacesuit. And still, because of almost the same conditions on the two planets, you'd be able to run a bit faster than on Earth at around 8.5 miles per hour. Your first impression of Mars is that it's freezing cold. The average temperature here is about negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Even from afar, the planet looks reddish. Once you make your first step on the Martian surface, you understand why. The ground's covered with rusty colored dust. The same fine dust is floating in the air around you. Wherever you look, you see golden, brown, tan, and even greenish hues. They depend on the minerals that make up the soil. The size of the dust layer varies from area to area, but in most places, it's around seven feet thick. Hmm, that can make running much more difficult. On Mars, your weight would be much smaller than on Earth, a mere 58 pounds. This will help you achieve an impressive speed of 12 miles per hour. <laughs> Aren't you a champ? What's that on the horizon? It looks like a tornado. Is it a dust storm? Then it's time to make a run for it. Dust storms sometimes cover the entire planet, and you can even see the largest ones from Earth. And now you are facing a problem. You see, Jupiter, as well as Saturn, is a gas giant. This means that the largest planet in the solar system, and Jupiter is so large it could swallow 1,300 Earths, doesn't have any solid surface. Well, you'll just have to imagine what your running workout would look like if you could run on Jupiter. This planet has an atmosphere that consists of hydrogen and helium gas. During your descent, you admire thick brown, yellow, red, and white clouds. They make the planet look colorful and beautifully striped. On Jupiter, you'd weigh 390 pounds. You'd have to break a sweat to simply walk there wearing your clumsy spacesuit. If you could step on the planet's surface, that is. If you tried to run there, your best result would probably be a speed of one or two miles per hour. To make matters worse, it's extremely windy on Jupiter, with the wind speeds ranging from 200 to 400 miles per hour. Do you see those rings? That's Saturn, another gas giant with no solid surface. This planet's made up of mostly hydrogen and helium, and its temperature and density change the deeper you go. If you decided to leave your spacecraft and step on Saturn's surface, you'd just fall into the planet. But from above, it looks as if Saturn does have a surface. The seemingly solid yellowish-brown sphere is surrounded by several layers of clouds. The visible outer layer is made up of ammonia clouds. Under them, there are hydrosulfide clouds. And the innermost layer is made up of clouds of water. Even though Saturn is a gas giant, your weight wouldn't be very different here, around 165 pounds. That's because the planet's gravity is similar to that of Earth. But because of the conditions on the planet, and your bulky, bulky spacesuit, you'd run a bit more slowly there, at a speed of about 4 miles per hour. Before leaving, you admire Saturn's most famous feature, awesome gray, beige, and tan rings. These groups of tiny ringlets are made of chunks of rock and ice, you also spot several of the 53 moons of Saturn. Oh, that's Titan, an icy world bigger than our moon and even Mercury. It's the second largest moon in the solar system. The next planet on your way is a blue-green ball of ice and gas. That's ice giant Uranus. It has this beautiful hue because the light from the sun gets reflected off the planet's surface. Uranus isn't solid. Hit the brakes! If your spacecraft doesn't manage to stop in time, it'll fly through the upper atmosphere and sink into the icy liquid center of the planet. Hmm, I doubt you'll be able to conduct your running experiment here. 
So let's just imagine what it looked like. On Uranus, your weight would be around 138 pounds. And against all odds, you could actually reach a good speed here, at least eight miles per hour. If you didn't get caught in a hurricane, of course. Extreme storms occur on the planet in the summer when Uranus is heated the most. Then, hurricanes can spread for more than 6,000 miles. The furthest planet from the Sun, Neptune, is four times the size of Earth, but 17 times as heavy. The blue surface you see when approaching Neptune is actually a layer of swirling gas and permanent clouds. The planet's mantle is made up of water, ammonia, and methane ices. It's the closest thing Neptune has to a surface. And still, there isn't solid ground for you to walk on. So, once again, try to use your imagination. On Neptune, you'd weigh a bit more than you do on Earth, 174 pounds. But your running speed would be just a bit lower than on Earth, around 5 miles per hour. That's the end of your active adventure. Which planet did you like running on the most? Okay, picture this. In the not-too-distant future, you're heading out on a space vacation, and you need to decide which items are worth bringing along. But instead of checking the weather forecast, you open a gravity simulator. That's because you need to know how each object will behave on different planets. For instance, should you take this metal shovel with you or not? Well, according to your itinerary, it's going to be a long, long trip. You're planning to visit every planet in the solar system and even a few moons. But due to the difference in gravity on these space bodies, you're not sure how useful some of the objects you're going to bring along will be. Well, let's start with the basics. Tupperware. I don't know about other space travelers, but us Earthlings carry our Tupperware around everywhere we go. And still, if you were to transport it to, let's say, Mercury, it would most likely fly away into the atmosphere. These plastic containers you use to keep your food are too light. And since the gravity on Mercury is two and a half times weaker as gravity on Earth, well, maybe you'll have to fill your plastic containers up before taking them out of your spaceship to have a picnic. If a Tupperware container weighs about a half a pound on Earth, it'll weigh just a quarter of that on Mercury. Now, if we add some bananas, a handful of baby carrots, and two watermelons, then it'll be safe to carry it out of your space vehicle. You'll just have some difficulty making it all fit in in a standard size container. But wait! Before you do that, you should know that the atmospheric temperature on Mercury can reach up to 800 degrees Fahrenheit. This means that any plastic container will instantly melt as soon as it gets in contact with the air. It'll burn up all the food, too. You can probably try taking a titanium container, that will work, or just stick to astronaut food. Now, shall we say Venus? Okay, Venus. If you were to take the same empty container to Venus, it would behave similarly to how it does on Earth. This is because Venus is also known as our planet's twin. These two have much in common. For example, almost the same size and mass. And when the topic is gravity, the formula goes like this. The bigger the mass and the greater the density, the stronger the gravity. Venus's gravity is approximately 10% weaker than Earth's. So, yes, you may leave your spaceship with your container, empty or full, and enjoy a beautiful and scenic lunch on the surface of Venus. Now, you'll have to figure out a way to eat without taking your spacesuit off, though. The atmosphere of Venus is filled with sulfuric acid, which can irritate your nose and throat and cause difficulties in breathing. Or worse, much worse. Now, you'll have to forget about taking anything too light outside on Phobos. A little hint for you? It's not a Greek island. Not even Greek yogurt, although it's a cool name. It's actually one of Mars's moons. Here, even your spacecraft would need a little extra help to keep close to the ground. If it weighed as much as a school bus, any regular-sized person could pick it up with just one hand. This is because on Phobos, the inhabitants of Earth barely feel the weight of gravity. And be very careful when jumping around, because one leap and you may fly straight into outer space. Uh, passengers on board the Voyager spaceship, please keep your arms and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Well, you're approaching Jupiter, a gas giant. A never-ending storm is raging in its atmosphere. Plus, there's no solid surface there, which means no landing for you on this planet. If you look out the window, it might seem that you are moving through a giant cloud. 
But for the purpose of your experiment, it'll work just fine. Try throwing into the air that baseball you brought along in case you get bored of all the space travel. And measure the time it'll take the ball to hit the surface. If on Earth, the ball will fall at a speed of 32,174 feet per second. On Jupiter, the same ball will hit the ground at a speed 2.5 times greater than that. That's because Jupiter is more than 10 times as large as Earth, and around 300 times as heavy as our blue planet. Now, if you move your spaceship just a little bit to the side, to one of Jupiter's moons, Europa, the situation will be completely different. Throwing a baseball in the air on Europa will mean never seeing it again. Gravity there is almost non-existent, which means that not only a baseball, but even a grown-up person can fly away any second. Now, on the other hand, if you decided to venture out of the spacecraft to explore Europa's gravitational field, why not try to lift the space vehicle itself? On Europa, a regular Earthling can easily lift up to 1,000 pounds, which is the equivalent of a full-size male moose. <laughs> or you can lift a pyramid-like formation of nine regular people. Uh, the choice is yours. When approaching Saturn, be careful. While from afar, Saturn's rings look smooth and solid. From up close, you'll notice that they're made of chunks of ice and rocks floating in space. You won't want to have your spacecraft anywhere near those. There's also no solid surface on Saturn, which makes landing impossible. And the atmosphere is full of ammonia. Keep in mind that it's a pretty inhospitable environment for a human. Now inside the spaceship, you find a collection of sci-fi books, enough to fill an entire bookshelf. Altogether, they must weigh around 400 pounds. Yep, that many books. And like someone with a superpower, you try to lift over 200 pounds of weight at a time. But guess what? You fail! Because Saturn's gravity is too similar to that on Earth. Now in case you got confused with all this gravity talk, when we're measuring gravity, we're speaking about the power of the force by which a planet, or other space body, pulls objects toward its center. So if you need some help in organizing that sci-fi collection in alphabetical order, ask the crew to move the spaceship to a neighboring space body with a weaker gravitational pull. Like uh, Pluto. These days, it's not considered a planet anymore. Just a dwarf planet and one of the furthest from the sun's space bodies. You'll need an extra warm spacesuit to wear there. Pluto is freezing cold and has a tiny surface. It's smaller than Earth's moon. But it's a great place to test your strength. If on Earth it's kind of impossible for a regular person to lift an elephant, on Pluto, you'll be able to pick up a baby elephant weighing around 265 pounds. Or even a medium-sized elephant that can be as heavy as 2,000 pounds. On your way back to Earth, you make a pit stop on Uranus. The coldest planet in our solar system has an average temperature of around minus 350 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you attempt to get out of the spacecraft, you'll freeze mid-movement. Although gravity on Uranus is pretty similar to that on Earth, there's one thing that's very different – time. A two-week getaway on Earth turns into a three-year-long vacation on Uranus. Now, when you get sick of cold planets, you can travel back to warmer ones. <clears throat> Okay, now, Mars is definitely warmer than Uranus, but its average temperature is still about minus 81 degrees. On Earth, we only have such low temperatures at the South Pole during the winter. When you land on Mars, you'll start to feel light and strong at the same time. Mars's gravity is about 2.5 times weaker than that on Earth. So in other words, you'll probably manage to lift your own body weight without any difficulty. So, all those handstands you've been dreaming of doing, you've found a place to fulfill your dream. Hello there! Thank you for coming to the Space Job Agency. We have a whole bunch of departments. Intergalactic jobs, keep it in Milky Way, our solar system rocks, or gases, <laughs> and many smaller ones. Tired of a 9 to 5 routine on our planet? No problem. Let's see if you have any qualifications for newly opened positions. So, we've got here… Oh! An asteroid miner on Mars. As you know, asteroids are some sort of leftovers from times when our solar system was forming. Our scientists believe it's debris left of planet collisions and destruction. Tens of thousands of asteroids are circling our Sun. 
and most of them are between the orbits of Jupiter and Mars. That way, Mars is a perfect location for this job. Those asteroids can hide a lot inside. They're made of magnesium, iron, nickel. We believe some of them consist of oxygen, gold, water, and platinum. We need those for our industries. We have a station with food and everything else you'll need up there. So, you're in a specially designed spacecraft. You start from Mars, land on an asteroid, and start mining. Our machinery is lightweight and solar-powered, which means you need less fuel. Sometimes we send robots to do this, sometimes people. Robots don't need food or other supplies. On the other hand, they're not so precise as humans. You use similar techniques as miners on the Earth. Basically, you'll need to scrape the material off the asteroid. The majority of the ore will probably fly off, so you'll have to use a big canopy to collect it. Since the gravity on asteroids is so much weaker than on Earth, you'll have to learn how to use grapples to anchor yourself to the surface. That way, you can move around with little effort. Once you're done with one asteroid and the material is sent to Earth, you're going to the next one. Are you good at sports? I can see there is an ad for a ski instructor on Mars. Mars has four seasons, just like Earth. And winter there lasts around six Earth months because the year there is almost twice as long. The snow there is different because it's made of frozen carbon dioxide instead of frozen water. But don't worry, the best scientists made it completely safe. Snowball fights are not so fun. You get a poor pack of frozen carbon dioxide and a bit of water ice. But snowboarding, sledding, and skiing there are so cool. No, literally, the surface is almost frozen. The snow is not as thick as on our planet, but the surface is very slippery, so it's fun. So, you're gonna work there for six months, but if you plan to make some extra cash, we're transferring you to Europa, one of Jupiter's moons. Europa is very cold. Its surface is mostly composed of solid water ice, a subsurface ocean we didn't get to see yet. But, hey, our team of space divers is going there in three months. I'll check if there's a position open if you're interested. They say this ocean might have twice as much water as we have on Earth. Plus, our team of scientists still think this is one of the best spots to build Earth-like cities in our solar system. But until then, you can go as a skiing instructor. The surface is made of ice, so we created our own snow to go skiing. You'll like it there. There are many hills and domes on Europa. Some ridges are 5.5 miles across. So if you want some adrenaline, Europa has little to no atmosphere, so your suit protects you from radiation from the sun. Okay, the next one is a driver in a space taxi on Venus. Tourists love going there, despite that it's very, very hot. It's further away from our sun than Mercury, but it's still hotter. The thing is, the atmosphere there is like a blanket that traps the heat. The planet is scorching, so you can't stay there for too long. The company will provide you with a flying car that looks like a mini spaceship. You'll have to be a pretty good driver because the atmosphere is very dense. And it's also quite windy there. The speed often goes over 220 miles per hour. And it can get tricky with the clouds. You won't be able to see because the wind's moving them all the time, so you have to act fast. Plus, Venus is the planet with the most volcanoes in our solar system. Much of its surface is covered with volcanic deposits, making it hard to land and find a safe spot to land. If you accept this job, here's a tip. It's better to stay in the air. The view is amazing. Speaking of volcanoes, you can probably join our team of space volcanologists. As an assistant first, of course, but later, we'll see if you can take a better position in an intergalactic team. For now, you can stay in our solar system. We presume Mars, Venus, Pluto, and Jupiter's moon Europa have active volcanoes, but there's still no proof of that. The spots we know about for sure are moons Io, Triton, and Enceladus. Moon Finder. We have a department that's looking for new moons, even outside our galaxy. There's also another one where you get to visit and explore moons in our solar system. It has more than 200 moons, so you certainly won't get bored. If we're talking about a planet where you can't even land, 
like gas giants Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, and Jupiter, you'll visit their moons directly. All major planets have moons, except for Mercury and Venus. You'll have to visit these planets first and try to find their moon. Moons are awesome. For example, Dactyl is a moon that doesn't orbit a planet, but an asteroid. Before this, we didn't even know asteroids could have their moons. Hyperion orbits Saturn. It has an irregular shape, and we believe it's probably a part of a much bigger, ancient moon that got destroyed from a collision in the early stage of our solar system. It has a low level of density, almost half that of water. And what about Callisto, the oldest one? It orbits Jupiter, and its craters are 4 billion years old. Callisto helped us understand so much about our solar system. Space Jeweler <laughs> If you want to leave our solar system, you can visit what we call Diamond Planet. It's 41 light years away from Earth, located in the Cancer constellation. It's twice as big and dense as Earth but almost eight times more massive. Its parent star contains way more carbon than our sun, and this planet probably contains carbon too. The pressure and the temperature are huge, but we have a unique technology to deal with that. It's covered with diamonds, so your job is to collect it and make some amazing space jewelry. You can visit more interesting planets as a space jeweler, like one where it rains rubies and sapphires. The storms there are pretty crazy, but you only get to collect gems scattered across the planet after it's over. If you're more into making something out of glass, there's literally a planet where it rains glass. It's located 63 light years away from us. It's a little bigger than Jupiter, and you'll be amazed by the planet's atmosphere. It has a stunning azure color because it's mostly made of silicate. The wind there is crazy. It hits 5,400 miles per hour. For comparison, the fastest one we've experienced on Earth was 254 miles per hour. Oh, and the last one, Explorer, on the mission called mm -hmm. Planet 9. Beyond Neptune, you'll see many small worlds peacefully dancing in harmony, and the stubborn one that's still hiding, the Planet 9. We've been looking at it for a very long time. Our scientists think it exists because they noticed gravitational force affecting a small group of objects with clustered orbits. Planet 9 probably orbits our Sun in 7,400 years. It's six times as massive as Earth. It's either a gas giant or some sort of mini-Neptune, or even a rocky super-Earth. It's well paid, but I must warn you, it's a mission of your lifetime. We don't know when you'll be able to go back. It's far away. Neptune is the starting point of our investigation. It's a gas world, so you can't land on it. So you'll have to go to one of its moons called Triton. It's made of nitrogen ice and rock. You'll be fine. Just watch out for geysers there. They erupt on the crust, and then the atmosphere blows them away. And we're still not sure how dangerous they are. And you'll have to wear a special suit, because that's the coldest space object in our solar system we know about. So, are you accepting any of the offers? There are many different conditions on other planets and moons that could affect how your pet would evolve there. Take gravity, for example. On a bigger or denser planet, gravity would be higher, meaning that life would evolve to be shorter, sturdier, and perhaps with multiple limbs for structural support. On a lighter planet with weaker gravity, life could hop, soar, and glide more easily, and would be more likely to evolve a lighter, taller build. Mars is the fourth planet from the Sun, a dusty, cold, desert world. Mars is also a dynamic planet with seasons, polar ice caps, canyons, extinct volcanoes, and evidence that it was even more active in the past. Gravity on Mars is lower than on Earth, and it's farther from the Sun, so we would see less sunlight. Mars also has no protective magnetic field due to its thin atmosphere, exposing everything to radiation. Sometimes, strong winds create dust storms that howl around the whole planet, and the dust continues to settle for months after. Your pet dog on Mars would probably have a taller, robust build to compensate for poor gravity. 
and would have bigger eyes to better perceive the far-off sun. To protect itself from radiation, your dog would have to switch its pigmentation from melanin to carotenoids, which give carrots, tomatoes, and oranges their color. So the dog would probably have orange skin. Since Mars has weak gravity, your cat would probably be lighter and would jump more to get around the place. It would also have longer legs. Jupiter is called a gas giant. The planet is covered in thick red, brown, yellow, and white clouds. The clouds make the planet look like it has stripes. Living on the surface of Jupiter might prove to be challenging. Since there's no actual surface, the planet consists entirely of gas. But it doesn't mean it's just a giant cloud hanging in space. If you venture through its atmosphere to deeper parts, the gas becomes denser until it turns into liquid. So one layer of Jupiter is an ocean made of hydrogen instead of water. With high pressure, extreme temperatures, and a fluid environment, we'll have to draw some inspiration from deep water dwellers who deal with the same conditions but on a smaller scale. Your cats and dogs would be big isopods with shells to protect them from Jupiter's radiation. Like its fellow gaseous neighbor Jupiter, Saturn is a gargantuan cloud of hydrogen and helium with no solid land and powerful winds. Like Jupiter, it gets tighter within, but its core is much smaller. Its iconic rings are made of a myriad of ice particles, so nothing could live on them, unfortunately. Saturn's volume is greater than 760 Earths, and it's the second most massive planet in the solar system, about 95 times Earth's mass. Saturn's average density is less than water, so this behemoth of a planet could float in a bathtub if there were one of a suitable size. The only way to move within Saturn's thick fog is by flopping around like a jellyfish. Your dog would probably have an umbrella-shaped bell to propel itself up and no skeleton so that it wouldn't be crushed by the pressure. Your cat would have jellyfish tentacles to move around. Life is tough on Mercury. This tiny planet is closest to the sun, so the sunlight here is seven times more powerful than on Earth. No sunscreen would be able to manage that. Mercury is about two-fifths the size of Earth, with a similar gravity to Mars, or about 38% of Earth's gravity. This means that you could jump three times as high on Mercury, and heavy objects would be easier to pick up. Mercury's temperature is extreme, swinging between a scorching 800 degrees Fahrenheit during the day and negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit at night. It's all accompanied by constant meteor showers and quakes. As a bonus, there is a very thin atmosphere and no air to breathe. Flesh and bone could never handle these severe conditions. So instead, your pets here would be made of something similar to refractory metal, like titanium. There'd be no need for a respiratory system, so their pretty metal faces would be without a nose, and their eyes would probably look like thick sunglasses to protect them from all this sun exposure. If there's anywhere harder to live than on Mercury, it's Venus. Venus is the second planet from the sun and is Earth's closest neighbor in the solar system. Venus is the brightest object in the sky after the sun and the moon, and sometimes looks like a bright star in the morning or evening sky. The temperature here is a whopping 880 degrees Fahrenheit, and the atmosphere is so thick, it creates a greenhouse effect. The surface is dry and full of surprises like volcanic eruptions, hurricane winds, and lightning. And as a cherry on top, the pressure here feels like you're one mile underwater, giving you a never-ending headache. It would be hard to imagine your pet living on Venus. The only things that could possibly survive there are anaerobic bacteria. Venus eats away at everything, even metal, making quick work of any human spacecraft. And Venus's atmosphere contains phosphine, which is toxic for anything that breathes oxygen, but means life for microbes. Icy, dark, and plagued by strong winds, Uranus and Neptune are mostly made of cold liquids, methane, water, and ammonia. Methane makes Uranus blue, and it has faint rings, while Neptune is dark, cold, and very windy, as it's the last of the planets in our solar system. It's more than 30 times as far from the sun as Earth is. Neither of them has a solid surface, and their atmospheres slowly merge into the water around the planet's core. To boot, gravity on Neptune is stronger than on Earth and applies more pressure on everything. With such powerful gravity, your dog would be shorter, and your cat would be stockier, with muscular bodies and thicker skins against the cold. And considering the fluid environment, 
Your pet's best bet is to become like a cosmic whale or manatee floating around the blue planets. Pluto is not very big. It's only half as wide as the United States. Pluto is smaller than Earth's moon. This dwarf planet takes 248 Earth years to go around the sun. If you lived on Pluto, you would have to wait 248 Earth years to celebrate your first birthday. One day on Pluto is about six and a half days on Earth. The farthest planet-like object from the sun is appropriately freezing cold and covered with ice, with weak gravity and a flimsy atmosphere. The sun, from Pluto, is nothing more than a dot on the horizon, much like the moon for Earth, so there's not much going on in terms of light. But scientists suggest that there may be a water ocean under Pluto's surface and some nicer weather. Let's take notes from Earth's creatures with built-in antifreeze, like some insects and fish. Low gravity makes the muscles and bones shrink and the space between vertebrae expand, making your pets taller. Their posture would also change, since their spine, for the most part, would be out of a job. So they'd probably be tall, thin, and somewhat spider-like, with spindly limbs and a curved spine. On other planets beyond the solar system, the boundaries between plants and your pets could be blurred, and your pets might merge with plant life. Your pets might become tree-like, with beating hearts attached to their bodies, or with feet to move to better positions as they compete for light and water. You could also have a rabbit that spends most of its time staying still, photosynthesizing, and only running away if threatened. Or a massive dinosaur-like horse that splays itself out on the ground to get nutrients directly from the soil and obtains extra energy with the help of plants on its back. Cooperation could lead to some fascinating pets, such as a sea of amoeba acting as a single jelly-like mega-creature, thousands of voracious shrimp-like carnivores forming a single organism that devours anything in its way, or a web of intertwined trees that collect water in wide pitchers at the top of their canopies. Getting oxygen to muscles is a key for your pet's endurance. Here on Earth, octopuses use a copper-based molecule in their blood to shuttle oxygen, making them more sluggish than mammals and birds that use iron-based hemoglobin. Scientists have speculated about other types of oxygen transport that could make animals fitter. In atmospheres with more oxygen, we might see a pet monkey that can fly without ever having to stop for a rest. On cold planets and moons without much sunlight, such as the moons of Saturn and Jupiter, your pet dog might have to get by with chemical energy rather than take it from the sun. Also, in worlds without light, such as the depths of Enceladus's oceans, there might be little need to evolve eyes. Pets would probably sense their environments using other means, like gills and vibration sensors. We all remember seeing the Apollo lunar rover on the moon built for space missions in the 70s. Besides transporting astronauts for certain explorations, they were used for taking pictures and collecting soil samples for scientists to study. The vehicle was designed by Boeing, the company famous for building airplanes, and cost around 38 million bucks to build. The kind of loose change you'd find today in Elon Musk's couch. In the far future, technologies will be so advanced that a regular car for the moon will behave like a regular SUV we have today. It'll have a sleek look and might be produced by some famous car manufacturers available. Back then, the lunar rover used a T-shaped throttle to move the car left, right, backward, and forward. The futuristic one can be voice-controlled and require minimal human control. And we can't leave out the Earth roof. Hey, you really don't need a moon roof on the moon. Anyway, the moon's driving conditions are not that extreme compared to Mars or other planets. It's hard to believe that the first landing craft to enter Mars was Viking 1, launched on August 20, 1975. It arrived at Mars on June 19, 1976. But decades later, Curiosity, which had six legs and six wheels attached, took the stage as the cute robot explorer. It was designed for the rough terrain, so in the distant future, a human-operated vehicle can have a similar design for people who want to cruise by the Mars sunset. For any human-designed car to work on planets other than the Earth, they have to be electric or anything else that can produce an unlimited supply of energy. Gas-powered vehicles won't work in the vacuum of space, and certainly not on any planet other than our own. It can be powered by the strong sun and convert the energy to run the vehicle. The interior has to accommodate the extreme conditions on the planet, 
since the atmosphere is very thin and unbreathable. It has to be very warm, since Mars can reach sub-zero temperatures. The matter of gravity isn't that extreme, but frequent dust storms are the problem. The vehicle will also have wheels attached to legs to maneuver around properly, since the terrain is difficult to get around in. Now, my two cents here? Well, I think an all-leather interior with six-way seats front and back will be nice. Adding a 12-speaker sound system with RU Sirius FM radio is a must. Did I mention the Earth roof? Yeah, I did. And don't forget the 6040 fold-down rear seats so you'll have plenty of room to haul your camping gear on your weekend escapes. Meanwhile, it's still possible to have a panoramic glass view of the interior in a project like a tour bus on Mars. There are plenty of locations to discover, like the tallest mountain in our solar system and the snowy carbon peaks. The Red Planet can also have an express train ride that can take you from one place to another. It'll be one of those luxurious cabins that will take you from one landmark to another since Mars becomes colonized and established. The train will also be electric-powered or powered by another power source. Mars is a place where it's possible to have all kinds of vehicles, since the conditions aren't that different from Earth's. Just don't go outside without a helmet. If we designed a vehicle for Mercury, then get ready for bright light from the sun, in which case we would need to add industrial visors and blackout strips around the glass so that the sun won't get to us. At least we won't have to worry about the heat, since Mercury isn't the hottest planet in our solar system. Well, the temperatures can reach a soaring 800 degrees on a warm sunny day and drop down to minus 300 degrees at night. The vehicle will have to have multiple layers and coatings to withstand the conditions. And it will most likely have spider legs to move, since rubber wheels will melt instantly. And to save itself from damage, it'll need to dig underground to hide from the sun and atmosphere, just like a crab or those spiders that create hatch floors. Driving a vehicle on Pluto will be very challenging, considering that it's the furthest planet from the sun. Now, Pluto is technically not a planet anymore, but it's still a large enough mass to explore. Temperatures there can reach below 400 degrees. A mere jacket won't cut it. The vehicle will need super insulation to keep the operator warm and fuzzy. Methane ice surrounds the land and covers the mountains. Gravity is also an issue since it's very weak, which will make you float in the air. Now, designing a vehicle for Pluto will be tricky. The key for it to move and not freeze will be how the legs move. It'll also have legs like the one on Mercury, but will have a lot of heat generated to keep warm. The weight is enough to keep this vehicle in place. However, that can't be said for Neptune, the windiest planet in our solar system. It's impossible to breathe in the atmosphere, and the atmospheric pressure will crush you. Designing a vehicle is challenging, considering the many external factors, and will have to be pressurized to counter the external atmosphere. It will also need a special coating to counter the harsh temperatures. And because Neptune is extremely windy, it would need some sort of anchor to keep it in place. Something like a large drill that shoots from the belly of the car and digs underground. It will also have spider legs to move around, but they'll behave in a similar motion to how a camel walks. That way, it can maintain its center of gravity. Now, Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system, with temperatures reaching 1,000 degrees. The pressure will push your vehicle like a can, so it needs proper internal pressure to balance it out. This car will require all the upgrades for countering the heat. It will need proper coating, no glass, and even a special color to reflect the heat. Nothing can actually stay on the ground for too long, so spider legs won't really work. It'll need to hover slightly above the ground and float around. Now, Saturn is the second largest planet in our solar system and has a very windy upper atmosphere and very strong gravity. The rings around it are made up of ice materials that can range from the size of a pebble to the size of a school bus. The pressure is so strong that you'd be crushed the second you reach its atmosphere. Designing a vehicle would be very challenging and weird. It'll need the best technology for withstanding the crushing pressures and harsh temperatures. The vehicle will have to be large and composed of many internal layers. Since the upper atmosphere is windy, the vehicle will have to remain on the ground for as long as possible. Scientists don't know much of what the surface looks like, so the vehicle will have to be prepared to move on solid surfaces, liquid, and anything else in between. Now, I think it's called slop. 
It'll need mechanical arms to maneuver through the possible rugged terrain and multiple legs like a centipede. Those arms can pick up things and move them out of the way if it faces some obstacles. The long body can also detach itself and break into smaller pods for a quick escape. From what, we don't yet know. No human can step foot outside even if they wear protective gear. Robots will have to be deployed to test how human bodies can withstand the conditions. Jupiter has harsher conditions than Saturn, with the red spot being the most dangerous area on the planet. It's an extremely large area that has hurricane-like storms that have been going on for years. The vehicle will resemble that of Saturn, but extra heavy-duty. Scientists also don't know what's happening on the surface except for the crushing atmospheric pressure. The vehicle won't be able to move on the surface if it were to pass through the red spot, so it'll have to dig underground and move underneath. For that, it'll require a huge drill and many self-automated drones and vehicles that can be deployed from the main vehicle to help with digging and surveying. Once underground, it'll have legs that will help it crawl and a giant drill nose to dig further. Many of the body parts can also break off into smaller pods to get through certain terrains but can be easily reattached. The craziest place where we can launch a vehicle is the sun. There's no way to imagine it except being self-automated. Any human on board won't make it halfway in the journey. The launch will have to be from Mercury in a protective facility sheltered from the harsh temperatures. The vehicle will have to be made out of the best resources to withstand the extreme heat and gases and won't last more than a couple of minutes once nearby. It'll most likely resemble a satellite and float around to take some footage for us to study. It'll probably cost trillions of dollars, but the results will be worth it, won't they?